Good morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all today. Thank you all for your ongoing support and viewership during the, these long, long months over this past year. It is now my great pleasure to introduce today's program, a conversation with Jane Harmon, President Emerita of the Wilson Center and former Congresswoman, my former Congresswoman, so happy to have her here, in conversation with Ambassador John Emerson, Vice Chairman of the Capital Group International Inc. Her new book, Insanity Defense, Why Our Failure to Confront Hard National Security Problems Makes Us Less Safe, is available through Chevalier's Bookstore and Jessica will be sending out information on the chat of how you can order her book. So without further ado, John, please let me turn this conversation over to you. Thank you both. Well, thank you so much, Kim, and, and thanks all of you for uh, coming, tuning in and joining us, uh, wherever, whichever time zone you may be in, uh, but we, uh, we certainly appreciate it. You're in for a treat today. Um, you know, my dear, dear friend Jane Harmon uh, is uh, one of the most interesting, energetic, thoughtful people I know. She not only uh, led the Wilson Center for the last 10 years, which literally had her traveling around the world, uh, sitting on multiple boards and commissions on national security, intelligence related issues, uh, and, and other things, other boards uh, as well. But she was uh, had nine terms in uh, the United States Congress, never lost an election. Uh, she uh, actually started and, and immediately was involved in the intelligence side of things before 9-11, lived through the whole 9-11, 9-11 commission process, uh, took a couple year hiatus from Congress and then, and then came back in uh, until she left to, uh, uh, to run the, the Wilson Center. Um, she is an author. She knows many of the world leaders and uh, certainly all on a personal level, the folks who are leaders of our uh, or key players in the intelligence community in the United States over the number of years. But most importantly, Jane and I were law partners between her time working in the Carter White House as a senior advisor, the, the position secretary of the cabinet, which is where you're the president's principal liaison to all the cabinet members, which means you get to play in a whole lot of sandboxes there. Between that and uh, running for uh, Congress herself, Jane joined the Manat Phelps Law Firm. At that point, I was a, uh, I don't know, a second, third year associate. We both became partners around the same time. And uh, so we go way, way back. And uh, it was always uh, such a treat when Jane would come to Germany to uh, speak at the Munich Security Conference or just stay with us, uh, with Kimberly and me at our residence uh, in Berlin. So in any event, Jane, welcome. It's, uh, it's just so great to have you here and, uh, and particularly in an event that is um, so focused on your you know, home of, uh, of Southern California. Well, thank you, John. I wish I were there. Uh, I gather the weather is warm and warmer in Washington where I am than it is in LA, go figure. But uh, in addition to you and Kimberly and other dear friends, I have uh, two children and their spouses and four perfect grandchildren living in LA. And I remain a resident of Venice Beach. Uh, why would I ever give that up? And uh, I know a lot of my friends and your our common friends are listening in. And, and Kim said she was my constituent. I bet there are a lot of other uh, former constituents, and I just want to say thanks for the memories to everybody. Oh, that's terrific. That's fantastic. Well, Jane, given how uh, I know your schedule and, and how incredibly insanely busy you are, I can't believe you had the time to write this book. Uh, and by the way, I read it. It is a really, it's, a, it's not only something that uh, is hugely informative and about something that we all don't uh, know all that much about, uh, and uh, but it's also got some great fun war stories and a lot of insights in it. So I would encourage everybody to get it. You're going to be getting a little link that uh, that shows you how you can do that. But tell us uh, why you wrote the book in the first place. 
insanity yeah. defense. I mean, right. uh, I love the title. The title was suggested by my youngest of four children, Justine Harmon, who lives in LA. And I had a different title. I'll explain it in a second. She said, Mother, that is so boring. Call it insanity defense. And so we, uh, some of us listen to our children. We actually learn from our children. Just saying. I know you learn from your three girls. So uh, at any rate, back to this. Um, I wrote the book because I am a total unreconstructed policy junkie. And I am very interested in how public policy is made. It's not always pretty. And over the years, I migrated to the security, intelligence, and defense space. Uh, why? Because uh, it, it actually started before my, my terms in Congress, but uh, I was a special counsel to the Defense Department briefly, and uh, I did a lot of work for Senator John Tunney, which is where I really started my career, uh, as his counsel and ledge director in, in, in foreign policy. But uh, I migrated because my district, the 36th district of uh, Southern California in the South Bay area, Ted Lieu now represents it, makes most of our intelligence satellites. And so if you're representing a district, you better learn the business of the district. And I did. And um, I, I went to work and, and got the best experts and toured around and uh, then served in Congress on the three major security committees, uh, uh, Armed Services, Intelligence, and Homeland Security, which was a new committee, and watched uh, in the th three decades since the Cold War ended, uh, that includes my decade at the Wilson Center after I left Congress, are, are constantly ducking the hard security questions. And what I concluded was, and this is what the book is about, uh, that by failing to deal with hard security questions since the Cold War, we've made the, the world, but also our country, less safe. And so the book is about how did that happen, wh where was Jane, and what should we do about it? Well, boy, when you look at uh, just the headlines of the last few days and you see, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, ballistic missile test in North Korea yesterday, you read about uh, our efforts to begin to address the, you know, the solar wind cyber attack uh, that occurred. You see the, uh, you know, attempts to interfere in our electoral process. You see domestic uh, terrorism on the rise uh, in, in the United States. And, and then, of course, we have the tragedy of these mass shootings continuing. Uh, it couldn't be a more important time for us to dive into this topic. But before we do that, let, let me do this. I think just as a matter of level setting, uh, and, and I had the, the privilege uh, and, and honor as being ambassador of, of working extremely closely with our intelligence community, but could you kind of step back a little bit and sort of just explain to people what the IC is? What is the intelligence community, the various uh, different, uh, you know, organizations within the United States government that um, uh, that comprise the intelligence community, the role of both the House and the Senate oversight committees and the role that they play. Uh, and let me just to start that off, uh, uh, there was a, a quote in your book that I loved uh, that I think is really important for everybody to understand in terms of this level setting. Intelligence is not policy. It's not science either. Intelligence is a set of predictions based on the best facts about human intentions and adversary capability. Uh, so I'll just leave it with that and then throw it to you to, to tell us a little bit more about the IC and, and how it all is supposed to operate. Um, okay, in two minutes or less, let's go. Uh, so my mother, um, who uh, was an extremely bright woman who always told me, uh, don't waste the years between 40 and 60. They're your most valuable years. Be sure you are doing things you're passionate about. Was right, and I did. Um, but <clears throat> a little uh, over 60, I'm not wasting those years either. Advice to self and advice to everybody else on this call. My mother worked for OSS during World War II, the Office of Strategic Services, if anyone has ever heard of that. That was our original intelligence agency. And it was headed by a general named Wild Bill Donovan. And it was the eyes and ears for the United States during World War II. Uh, and she had a you know, fairly menial job, but she had enormous respect for what we were doing. So I kind of filed that. And along the way, in addition to my district being focused on these things, uh, kind of wanted to make her proud. Uh, sadly, she died just after I was elected to Congress. 
but I think I made her proud. The intelligence community has evolved uh, starting in, in 1947 when we set up the National uh, Security Act, uh, which is basically the framework for our modern security structure. Um, a little outdated, think about a 1947 business model. The intelligence community has a number of federal agencies in it. It's not just the CIA. John wants me to tell you that. It is not just the CIA. You've all heard of the CIA, which is the uh, successor of, the, of OSS. Uh, but it is a series of other agencies that do a variety of things. The, C the CIA is basically our spy agency, but we have an agency that listens, uh, think satellites, think satellites made in the South Bay, called the National Security Agency. We have an agency that does mapping. We have an agency that, uh, we have a cyber command now in the Pentagon. We have 16 different uh, military intelligence agencies, uh, which are attached to the various military services and other functions. And then we, we now have, because we reorganized a lot of this, and I played a leadership role in that, that's in the book, uh, along with uh, Senator Susan Collins, um, we, we now have an office of the Director of National Intelligence, uh, the DNI role, which is a command across the 16 non-military uh, intelligence agencies. And the point of that is uh, to connect the dots. In, in case anybody, <coughs> anybody missed it, on 9 whoops, on 9-11, no water, on 9-11, uh, we didn't connect the dots. We had pieces of information about people plotting to attack America, and we didn't put them together. And then we prepared really bad intelligence also in the book uh, that claimed that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction a year later. And again, we didn't vet the spies, we didn't connect the dots, uh, some of it was cherry picked. And so we had two major intelligence failures, which led to a recommendation by the 9-11 Commission, which you mentioned, John, which was co-chaired by somebody named Lee Hamilton, former senator, a former congressman who had the job I had at the Wilson Center before me, uh, and Tom Kane, who was a Republican governor from New Jersey, and they recommended that we do this reorganization, and I took the lead in the House, and we did it in 2004. So, that, so our intelligence community is a lot of stuff, but the kind of key organizer of it now is the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, headed by a woman named Avril Haines. And, uh, and, and then from a, uh, an, an oversight standpoint, we not only have the uh, congressional committees, but there's also this idea, of, I, I guess it pertains much more to intelligence gathering within the United States, of the FISA courts. And that got, we'll get into that in just a minute, but uh, because that related to something that you and I experienced together, but, but, um, uh, but that, uh, it, it, that's an interesting thing that comes up now and then as well. Talk a little bit about that and the oversight function okay. of the spies. Um, you know, so uh, in, that actually is a, a, a kind of a separate thread. There were abuses during the Nixon administration, which had to do with unlawful spying uh, by the White House on a variety of folks, which led to uh, a congressional committee called the Church Committee. Frank Church was a senator from Idaho. And the church committee recommended major reform, basically in the Congress, the creation of intelligence oversight committees. I served on one of them, as I mentioned, for eight years. Uh, and, the, and a federal law called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. We'll get to that. But the key part of that is Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Uh, the nickname of it is FISA. And uh, the congressional intelligence committees still exist you may have seen the, the soap opera that sadly is much of the work now of the House Intelligence Committee, very ably led by Adam Schiff of California. Uh, the ranking member now is Devin Nunes. And um, my only comment there is that committee uh, doesn't work in a, in a seamless bipartisan way uh, as it used to uh, when I served there. The, uh, well, the, the thing, I, thanks for that. The, the point I was making, uh, you're referring to obliquely was uh, uh, a situation that occurred uh, very early in my tenure uh, as ambassador uh, when the news broke uh, that uh, allegedly we had been tapping Chancellor Merkel's cell phone. And uh, uh, this is, uh, most people don't remember that I was the one involved, but they, I, you know, was in, I think I was on the front page of every picture in the country doing the perp walk going into being 
what is called convoked, which is a diplomatic term for being yelled at by the host government. First time since the Second World War that a uh, American ambassador was convoked by the German government. Uh, so there was great, great upset about this. And that happened to be right around the time when you, it was your first visit to Berlin while I was there. And we had a dinner in your honor. And that entire dinner ended up becoming almost a rending of garments by uh, many of the high level Germans who were in, in attendance about how just absolutely distressing this was. And it'd be interesting, I don't know if I ever told you this, subsequently Barack Obama said to me, and by the way, the, the Germans could not, of course Obama knew this, he said he never actually knew that this was going on. And of course, people say, how is that possible? What they don't understand is the President's Daily Brief, the PDB, which I know you've seen and, and I saw, at least as it related to Germany and Europe and, and some issues pertaining to Russia and the Middle East, uh, it, it's written in prose. You know, if you want to get the under, they don't say in a phone call at such and such a date, such a tie, Angela, they would say Angela Merkel believes or Angela Merkel has said, or she has told people that could be diplomatic reporting. It could be any number of sources. So, uh, so it is believable that the president didn't necessarily know that. He was up quite upset when he heard about it. But I guess the question is, given all the restrictions, how does something like that happen? And will, uh, what can be done to, um, uh, or what triggers uh, could occur, uh, cause that to occur in the future? Uh, well, first, it was um, a dumb idea to tap. Angela Merkel's cell phone. <laughs> Secondly, I showed up just at the right time to be the decoy for you. I mean, I came to the to the dinner party and I was no longer ambassador or I, I don't think I was still a member. No, I wasn't a member of Congress. So no, you were at Wilson Center. It was really your fault, but I, I I took I took a bullet for you. And uh, it was a really dumb idea to explain how it could happen is we all we just mentioned FISA. FISA was passed in the late 70s to regulate uh, the, the, the handling of foreign intelligence. Uh, we want to collect foreign intelligence and our adversaries collect intelligence too. So, you know, nobody has, as they would say in the law, clean hands doing this. But we want to learn uh, the, the in, in, intentions and capabilities of our adversaries and our friends sometimes. Uh, we want to learn this in a lawful way uh, with the boundaries set by this law. And it used to be uh, that the only foreign intelligence collection, or as I remember it, uh, was through this law and people would go to the, what you mentioned, these FISA courts, these special classified courts, and they would have to get a warrant to do an individual action, whatever that might be. And they'd have to explain who the target was and why that, that was relevant to us. Well, over the years, like everything else, things expanded. And in addition to that, during the Reagan administration, an executive order, I'm sure we're going to talk about those in a minute, was promulgated called Executive Order 12333, 1, 2, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. And that was the authority to tap Merkel's phone. It wasn't through FISA. Um, but as described in the book, over time, uh, especially uh, after 9-11, the Bush 43 administration engaged in actions outside of FISA. Some of us in Congress didn't know that, um, but also uh, 12333 was used for a number of actions and still is used for a number of intelligence actions. And it doesn't surprise me that Obama would not specifically know of this dumb action uh, to do what, what happened, but he obviously, you apologized, he apologized, and I haven't heard about uh, since uh, that we've done something like this. This was her personal cell phone. Well, what we did was um, uh, he, I, I immediately called uh, our mutual friend Susan Rice when this was breaking, and I said the president has got to say we do not and will not be uh, monitoring the communications of Angela Merkel, and uh, of course that left as the pregnant pause. What have you been doing? Which I dealt with, uh, but the um, uh, but he gave gave us one better and said we do not and will not be monitoring the communications of uh, the heads of state and heads of government of our friends and allies. So it was a much more expansive, you know, kind of prohibition on that. And I've certainly seen nothing or read nothing that suggested it, you know, that yeah. hasn't been continued, although who knows? And the interesting thing to me about that is I, you can always see why there might be a justification for yeah. doing one thing or another. As an example, and I, I this is 
I, I'm not violating any uh, uh, confidentiality here because, uh, because I don't know the facts. But as an example, in 2003, when we were preparing to go to war in Iraq, uh, Gerhard Schroeder, who was the Social Democratic Chancellor of Germany, was in effect leading an effort in the UN to uh, prevent or condemn this action. They, they, Germany was not supportive of that. You had Angela Merkel as the leader of the opposition party who was, you know, in all likelihood going to challenge uh, Schroeder in the next election. You can see why someone might have thought, hey, it might be a good idea to know what she is thinking. And somebody told me something else. They said the problem, one problem in the intelligence community, because I, I would say, you know, the Germans are so transparent with us. There's no reason in the world why, you know, we would need to do something like this. They say a lot of people in the intelligence community don't believe that it's accurate unless it, they've heard it uh, surreptitiously. So in other words, you can say, oh, I had a conversation with the chancellor and she told me A, B, C, and D. They won't necessarily believe it unless they hear it surreptitiously. So that is, that that's, I think, an ongoing problem. But the question I have is, you know, you can see why something may have been started, but as we all know, in big organizations, 10 years down the road, it often isn't the case that someone goes, you know, that thing that we started 10 years ago, should we still be doing that? And I'm just wondering, in, in your sense, are there uh, speed breaks that have been imposed on things like this, uh, or is this still an ongoing uh, concern or an ongoing risk? Um well, I don't know what has been imposed on this. Uh, you know, I, I don't have I, no class. Well, no, I don't mean this, this but, kind of thing, no, I guess. But, you know, there, Executive Order 12333 is still out there. Uh, we are two presidents later. And what exactly happened in the last administration or is happening in this, I, I don't really know. Should there be speed breaks inside the IC? Absolutely. And there may be. So uh, I don't know. But I think... Uh, our government, especially our Congress, is not a learning institution. And we always say we're going to do after action reports and get it right. Well, think uh, this, th this pandemic. I mean, we've had three or four before this. There was a rule book. There was a, uh, a strategic supply center in the United States for, for this protective gear and other things. And oops, uh, everything was depleted when we came to this, this new enormous crisis. So, we need to learn better than we have. I, I just wanted to, to make a, a couple of points. And I think you're right that, that there may be instances where we do need to learn and should uh, the plans and intentions of our friends. Uh, and that has national security implications. We don't need to know if Angela Merkel you know, got her hair done in a specific place or any of that stuff. Uh, I certainly don't think so. But we, we might need to know, right, if in the opposition she is planning something that would have a direct effect on a key national security issue, was, which was going to war in Iraq. And I just want to make one point on that, because I was ranking member on the House Intelligence Committee. I read everything having to do with the, this national intelligence estimate called an NIE uh, that made the case uh, for going to war with Iraq because they had, uh, allegedly, nuclear and chemical weapons and were planning, at least with respect to chemical weapons, this is, in, this is uh, publicly re reported, I won't reveal any classified information, planning to harm us, harm us in the U.S. That's what these, uh, some of this information was. So I, I read everything. I traveled to Europe and met in, with intelligence agencies. I went to the Middle East uh, and I came home and I, I literally came home. And my late husband, Sidney Harmon, was there. And I said, John, you know him and you know, we can tell lots of stories. Um, and I said, Sydney, I've decided to vote for, for the, uh, uh, the war resolution. You decided what? And I said, I've read everything. I've traveled everywhere. I've looked at every uh, backup paper. Uh, you know, I've really done my homework on this. And you're a business guy. You haven't done a thing. Uh, how do you know? You know why, why, why are you saying this? I was really startled. And he said, you'll see. And what's the point? He was right. I was wrong. I mean, I was fooled by the intelligence, which was a very sloppy product, cherry picked to make the case. And so that's one of the things in the book. How, you know, what did we learn and how do we prevent this from ever happening again? And there are things we're already doing to fix our intelligence products, but we can do a lot more uh, to do that. So uh, you weren't, no, you weren't ambassador then. You didn't have to suffer the slings and arrows. I mean, 
what I have I said. Came for, I came after that, yeah. But what I've said for all these years is the intelligence was wrong and I was wrong. But you know what? A lot of people believed it. A lot of people besides oh, sure. Harmon <laughs> believed it, and and the smarter ones didn't. So let me, I mean, to that point, you have, uh, and this may even be a chapter heading, but this, uh, this quote uh, from your book sort of stuck with me. Power over truth corrupts intelligence. And I think about uh, some of the hollowing out of the of disloyal, if you will, or deep state people from the intelligence community over the last four years uh, and all that. Why don't you expand a little bit, unpack what you mean with by that that powerful statement, power over truth corrupts intelligence. Well, there is a, uh, a motto in the main hall of the CIA, which is really a hallowed space, because on the wall in this main hall are a bunch of stars. And those stars are of intelligence officials who have died in the line of duty. You need to know that uh, to serve in some of the places they serve, uh, their jobs are not disclosed. You know, they're called something else if they're working in an embassy uh, setting or even if they're working somewhere else, they're on a team doing something else. And their families often uh, don't even know what they're doing and can't accompany them. So they're out there. And some of these people, uh, surprise, surprise, uh, are killed in the line of duty. And those are the stars on that wall. And some of the names are still not disclosed. I mean, it's, it's an astoundingly uh, selfless act to give your life for your country in, in, in a role like that. So I am you know, reverential about these people. Uh, but there's this motto um, that says, and the truth shall set you free. And the point of it is that the intelligence community is supposed to speak truth to power. That's why I flipped it on the title. Uh, truth to power. Power are other people who make policy. You, you read my other quote that intelligence is not policy, but you know, bad intelligence will probably lead to bad policy. Good intelligence might lead to good policy. But at any rate, over the over the recent years, we have kind of lost that. And uh, uh, certainly uh, the last administration only wanted people in key roles in intelligence who would tell the president what he wanted to hear. He had very, at least according to reported sources, and I don't have any other information about this, uh, he had very short briefings. Uh, usually on one page and sometimes a chart. It's not that he didn't ask questions. He did ask some questions. Uh, but basically, anyone who told him something he didn't want to hear uh, at a senior level was gone. And he put in there people who he knew uh, would change the focus to be a support system, you know, a, uh, a boombox for him. And that is absolutely a, 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 it's a, a violation of what the IC was set up to do. And I'm not saying it's never happened before. It has happened before. And I know, by the way, in the Bush 43 administration, Porter Goss, whom I like, like very much, who was chairman of the committee when I was ranking member for a time, went over to be CIA director and took some staff with him. And that staff was recent staff of his. And what they did, sadly, was purge people uh, from the agency. Then people who happened to be uh, uh, it's it's not clear what what all, uh, who met most of whom happen to be Democrats. I, you know I don't care what somebody's party affiliation is in the IC. I care if they're speaking truth to power. That's how I would see it. But at any rate, uh, Goss did a purge, and then there was a commission looking into uh, the mistakes of the post of the 9/11 post 9/11 world, and Goss was relieved of duty uh, for that. And so we, as I say in the book, we saw that movie, and it didn't end well, and we just saw it again. And hopefully we are learning now and the people who are there now, uh, and I commend them and I don't care what their party affiliation is. I just care what their commitment to our country is. Yeah, it's um, uh, that, that's hugely important to uh, to keep that in, um, in place. I, I mean, there's so many other questions I have. Let me I'm going to try to consolidate a couple of them, though. A big part of your book is devoted to the relationship between the executive branch and Congress as it relates to intelligence and intelligence oversight. And uh, uh, both are kind of two pieces of it. I mean, number one, sort of Congress stepping back from responsibility that it should be taking. And then the other piece, of course, the executive grabbing it. Now, you, you know, you didn't have to, you'd have to be in a cave not to have read multiple stories and articles in the last couple of years, particularly with Attorney General Barr and his view about expansive presidential power 
uh, and, and some of what was happening in the courts in that regard, not necessarily related to the intelligence community, but just sort of in general. And, um, uh, and you've commented a couple of times on, on these executive orders. Uh, I think you have an entire chapter that's called Presidential Power Unchecked and Unbalanced. Uh, and particularly at a time when you're seeing, uh, you know, greater gridlock in Congress, and we look at the last two years of Obama, the last two years of Trump, and the media period of time in the Biden administration, it's this whole executive order, governance by executive order, has just been increasing across the board. Uh, why don't you unpack that a little bit for us and what some of the dangers are for that in terms of, uh, you know, getting the kind of intelligence that will lead to good policy uh, in the United States. Well, to remind, our, our uh, Constitution ha uh, uh, has three articles. Article one sets up Congress and as the lawmaking body. Article two says that the executive branch shall carry out the laws enacted by Congress. Article three is the federal court system. So Congress is the article one branch. And what has been tragic over um, our years, John, because you're a junkie too, don't let me let you off the hook. You may be a business mogul, but you're a political junkie. Yes, you are. Uh, is the uh, decline of Congress as a functioning institution, the rise of toxic partisanship. That's the reason I left Congress, by the way. Uh, I really couldn't stand the current business model, which is blame the other side for not solving the problem because if you work with the other side to solve the problem, then you are bipartisan and that makes you target practice in your primary. And, and both parties do this. In fairness, it, it is unfortunate. Uh, and I had you know, partisan primaries and people have a right to run for office. So don't let me diminish or disrespect people, but I'm saying uh, one of the hits on me was that I was too bipartisan. So, okay, Congress has become toxically partisan, and we see it, it in the close margins in both houses, they're unable to do very much. And there's this new push to, to get rid of the filibuster to make the Senate function. Um, well, we'll see where that goes. But, but while that's been happening, the executive branch has been filling the, the vacuum, and especially since 9-11. And uh, Dick Cheney and his other friends, like Don Rumsfeld, believed in the, uni uh, the, the uh, unitary executive theory, which was, uh, is executive branch power trumping the power of basically of any other branch. And, and um, they used it under the Article II commander in chief authorities of the president, which are in Article II. The president is our commander in chief and can in emergencies act, but they metastasized it into basically unaccounted power. And that has stuck with us. Uh, president Obama didn't repeal all that stuff and used executive orders and signing statements for a lot of the things that he did. And then came Trump uh, and um, now comes uh, Biden, who is a creature of Congress um, and our most experienced foreign policy president since George H.W. Bush, since the Cold War ended. And he gets credit, I think, with Reagan for helping to end the Cold War. Uh, but here comes uh, uh, Biden and he issues a slew of executive orders. Now, a lot of them are just repealing the Trump executive orders, but we need Congress to uh, get, get in this game, uh, amend laws that, that need amending, including deal with this executive order 12333, if it should have boundaries around it. Congress can act to curb or eliminate things that are in executive orders, unless they are emergency orders. And this one's been around since Reagan, so it's kind of a long emergency. And, and so, uh, we need Congress to, to grow bipartisanship and grow courage and enact things like the authorization to use military force or repeal the one that, were, that is still in use, which was enacted in 2001 to go against those who attacked us in Afghanistan. Well, oops, we've been in 19 countries and we've done 40 military actions under the 2001 AUMF. I don't think that that's adequate. Well, you know, it's interesting, and for all the uh, lawyers or recovering lawyers, such as uh, the two of us who are on this phone call, I, I found it interesting, your reference uh, to the Youngstown Steel case uh, against Harry yeah. Truman uh, when he tried to, you know, seize the steel assets uh, in terms of that relationship of uh, Congress and, and presidential power. And, and Article One is Article One for a reason. So, um, 
Uh, it, 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 it's too bad. Let me just, before we go to audience questions, which we'll do in a minute, uh, let me ask you about one other thing that's just constantly in the news, and that's cyber and cyber attacks. And one thing you wrote about that struck me that I wasn't really aware of is you say that our adversaries have taken advantage of our own laws to circumvent jurisdiction of some of our best cyber defenses by using servers in America. Why don't you um, unpack that a little bit? And uh, uh, because this is whether you're involved in business or you're worried about the integrity of elections uh, or just uh, the ability of our government to, uh, uh, to function or worried about air safety and uh, you know 5G internet of uh, things uh, and the dangers that cyber attacks uh, can present in all of those areas. This is, this is hugely important. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what we need to do to better protect ourselves on cyber? Well, and, and you're a senior uh, executive in a major company, which if attacked could compromise the, the records of all of your customers, uh, plus a lot of other things in ways that would seriously hurt them and hurt your business. So uh, first answer to that for everyone listening is understand cyber hygiene. Please, you can do this personally. It is really hard for a cyber, for a, a digital adapter like me to get through my, my brain cell depleted head. Uh, but you really need to uh, have, have uh, 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 the right passwords and, and double authentication and do all kinds of, of, of uh, protections for various functions and then use a tool like Dashlane. I'm not chilling for Dashlane to remind you what the passwords are because people like me can't remember any of that stuff. Uh, but at any rate, you have to do that personally. On uh, the cyber attack piece, uh, a guy named David Sanger, who writes brilliantly for the New York Times, uh, just wrote a book or recently wrote a book at the Wilson Center uh, called uh, The Perfect Weapon. And cyber is the perfect weapon for these times. It's a better weapon than firing muskets on a battlefield or dropping nuclear weapons because we can find out who did that very quickly. We often can't attribute who launched a cyber attack until much later. We actually can't even find the cyber attack until, uh, until much later. And so our, our challenge is uh, to do a, a number of things better. One is to try to prevent cyber attacks. And this is now harder because as I write, uh, uh, foreign entities, they don't have to be countries, they can be rogue actors, uh, are finding ways to penetrate the US and use our own servers against us. And so our laws, which have to do with foreign intelligence and our agencies, which mostly are focused on foreign interventions, uh, don't have authority. I mean, our, we have domestic agencies like the FBI, uh, which does a very good job, but it doesn't have the, the, the cues, the same cues that a foreign intelligence agency would have. So they're figuring out how to attack from within and they're not attacking one target. They're attacking multiple government targets and multiple private sector targets. And these attacks are coming from all over the place. So as I said, trying to prevent them is best. Attributing them quickly is good. Uh, in the case of two of the most recent attacks, we didn't find out until months later and our government didn't find out. A private uh, agency named CrowdStrike found out and I don't know if Cap Group was one of the targets or not. Good for you. I mean, Wilson Center is an int intended target all the time. We do pretty well, but just saying, uh, it's, we have to be vigilant. Uh, but this is going to be the hardest problem, not just preventing and attributing, but responding is tricky. Uh, if we respond in a way that, that is tit for tat, that engenders an even bigger attack, I'm not sure we're getting anywhere. So we're trying to be subtle, and we shouldn't do all this through the airwaves either. So, you know, we're going to have a multi pronged attack to the recent. Uh, China and Russia attacks, which have been attributed and which were, uh, in the Russia case, approved personally by Vladimir Putin, so we think. So hard problem. Again, this is one of them we have to have the, the, the guts to solve or we're going to increasingly be less safe, even, even though uh, in many ways uh, we have taken good steps to protect ourselves. Well, thanks for that. And of course, the book is Insanity Defense, and uh, we're going to move to... Uh, Jessica, who's going to come in, and I, I would imagine there are a whole lot of questions that have been uh, coming in through uh, uh, the chat function or the Q&A function. But Jessica, let me throw it over to you to uh, to lead us through the Q&A period. 
Thank you so much, Ambassador Emerson. Yes, we've got a lot of questions coming in. I'll just jump right into it, Jane. Um, as NATO's at, at NATO's cyber conference on or conference on cyber conflict, there were discussions about what constitutes an act of war in regard to a cyber attack. Please mm -hmm. share on this delicate question. Yeah. Um, there is no definition yet that I'm aware of. Maybe something was said at NATO that I don't know about whether what constitute what kind of cyber attack constitutes an act of war. Uh, but think of cyber as a as a war weapon. I mean, there's no question that it can cause damage equivalent to war. I mean, pick what kind of war you want. But if it takes down uh, the electric grid of a country, and that has happened several times with Russian attacks. Uh, and, uh, one in Georgia and one in and, and, and attempted attacks elsewhere uh, and and whole parts of a country go dark and people die. I mean, explain to me why that isn't war. Uh, a hard question that relates to that is to find out uh, whether we're being attacked, we actually have to be in the other person's network so that we know what they're doing. That's how we learn this. I mean, it used to be you listen to Angela Merkel's cell phone, but if you're in in the German network and you sense that, I'm not saying we're in the German network, if you're in the Russian network, a Russian network, and you sense that they are uh, moving against us, then you know. But the problem with that is if you're in their network, they might perceive that we're attacking them, that we're being offensive, not defensive, and they might miscalculate. So this whole thing of, of cyber and, and war is Im immensely complicated. NATO, uh, John would probably know this better. I don't know, John, I think on your watch, NATO woke up and started developing cyber capacity. Before that, it was a bunch of silos and it really yeah. didn't have any ability to, to integrate uh, anything about cyber. Am I right? I mean- Yes, no, that's exactly right. And, so, and by the way, the, the Russian, you know, the, the uh, uh, illegal annexation of Crimea and the infiltration of the Donbass was sort of an impetus for NATO to start getting its act together uh, mid-2014. Uh, the Donbass is the eastern part of Ukraine, which is still destabilized by Russia. And Crimea was, was part of Ukraine that was taken back uh, by Russia uh, in violation of international law, and they still have it. So, I mean, th these are very dangerous uh, circumstances. By the way, you didn't ask me about the, the, uh, the gas pipeline. Nord Stream 2. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that was um, another topic that, that came up quite frequently during um, my time in Germany, which is this, and now is very much in the news, which is the Rus Russian finance, Gazprom finance pipeline, into gas pipeline into Germany. And, and it's interesting the Obama and Biden administrations oppose it, the Trump administration opposed it, but for pretty different reasons. The uh, Obama-Biden opposition was largely for, based on geopolitical reasons. Uh, number one, it would allow Russia to have a stranglehold on uh, the pipeline that currently goes through Ukraine, that Ukraine gets a fair amount of revenue from the transit fees on. And uh, obviously, if Russia can get their gas to Europe in other ways, even though they've made pledges uh, that, oh, no, no, we won't uh, stop doing what we're doing through Ukraine. We know that's not even worth the paper it's printed on. And, um, uh, and, and, and also, obviously, at a time when Russia has been behaving badly, so to speak, yeah. in a number of areas to give them this sort of reward is uh, uh, problematic as well. So it's, um, uh, it's an interesting issue there. But anything you wanted to add on that, Jane? Just that you were a really good ambassador. I, I, I didn't say this. Of course, I would say this. I'm totally unbiased. But you got into the policy issues, and you had the trust of the president and the top levels in the White House. Some ambassadors are, you know, you were a political appointee. There's nothing wrong with that. But some ambassadors uh, have um, fewer skills than you than you do. And it really helped the United States at a time when a few things with Germany were dicey, and they still are, because Angela Merkel, just to bring call up our your friend, uh, is in favor of this uh, Gazprom uh, pipeline, and the rest of Europe is opposed to it. So, and and the U.S. is opposed to it. So it's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks for those comments, Jessica. 
Thank you. <laughs> Can you comment on proposals to create a domestic cyber monitoring authority? I could see how that appeals to the intelligence community, community to improve their work, but from a civil liberty standpoint, it seems most would be vehemently against it. Well, actually, it, it's in a law passed by Congress that the White House needs to create a uh, cyber commander. I don't remember the name of the person, but as a as a standalone position, and the White House is resisting it, even though it's in the law. So you know, stay tuned about what's going to happen. There is a, there is pushback by the civil liberties community, uh, and there is you know this tension between security and liberty. I say in the book because I, I, this is how I have seen this my entire professional life. Some may disagree that security and liberty are not a zero sum game. They are not. We have to protect both. I mean, otherwise. Uh, if we're protecting liberty and our defenses go down and, you know, we have a massive uh, destabilizing cyber attack, everyone's going to say, oh, my God, call in the National Guard. Let's do everything we can. And then we we'll close down liberty. So when we pass this legislation setting up the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, we also created a Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board called the PCLOB. It's a lovely acronym. And the sad part of that was, and they were supposed to be at the front end of all policymaking to be absolutely sure that we were protecting liberty at the same time as enhancing security. Uh, but they they were re really, surprise, surprise, Bush 43 didn't do much with it. And Obama didn't either. And uh, we are now at a, at a point where hopefully this will be, you know, at its full strength and it will play the role. It's a standalone agency now. I'm not sure how that happened that it was supposed to. But with this cyber commander person, uh, the White House hasn't filled the position. It has somebody, an assistant to the president for cyber, but that's not the same job. And uh, I, Congress did this because Congress is worried about a massive cyber attack. So stay tuned. Uh, I think this is another hard problem. Can you expand on your husband's remark about the Iraq war that you will see? <laughs> Why was he right and you wrong? I want to know about his reasoning. Uh, well, you know, uh, it was not based on any diligence on his part. It was just based on wisdom, which I apparently didn't have. Uh, but um, and, and a lot of other people had that wisdom. I, I certainly get it. And some of you listening in are going to say, why? We were so smart and she was so dumb. Yes, check. Uh, he didn't think uh, that a case that Iraq, a tiny little country, could attack us in a, in, a, in, a, in a destabilizing way made any sense. Now, it's certainly theoretically possible that it, that it could have made sense. I bought the material that was in the, in, in the uh, estimates that I read. Um, but what we learned later was, uh, and, and boy, was he right, that this thing was gamed and that the products were written in a way that made things look like they were true that weren't true. Uh, where have we seen this movie again? Uh, but uh, a, a big piece, of, yeah, this will relate to John a little bit. Uh, a big piece of the uh, estimate was reports from, from a source called Curveball. Curveball was German. And he, I don't know, I you know, assume he was a real person. Uh, he was a fraud. And the Germans told us that, that he was a fraud didn't know that at the time. And we never vetted him. We just took what he offered and put it in this report. So uh, how dumb does that make me look? Oof, uh, pretty bad. And uh, how, how sad it is that, that it came to that. And the people who put the report together, many of them did not, they didn't know, they didn't know. Uh, but now we have requirements for vetting sources. We have uh, sort of red teaming requirements. In other words, outside people read these intelligence reports and say what they think of them. I mean, this is classified inside, but outside people with deep experience. And if agencies in the IC disagree with the conclusions, uh, their dissent is featured right on the front of the report. And in the case of the Iraq NIE, the State Department, which has an intelligence function, disagreed. Mm -hmm. And nobody knew that. So, I mean, we are smarter and our intelligence reports are better. And if Sidney Harmon were here now and I came home and I said, honey, I'm going to vote for whatever, uh, maybe he would reserve judgment. The title of your book, Insanity Defense, implies that power over truth more often than not overpowers the defense intelligence laws and policy. 
was the letter your intent? Was overpowering the law so, my intent? So, <laughs> the power over truth more often than not overpowers the defense intelligence laws and policy. Was the latter your intent? I'm, I'm having trouble with the question. My, my intent is, was to try to describe a set of hard problems, to try to describe over these 30 years uh, any role that I played in making them worse or better, uh, and then to suggest ways uh, to get this right. Uh, to get all of our government programs under law, to protect security and liberty, uh, to do something about Guantanamo Bay prison. Uh, that's a, described in the book. There I was. I went there four times, but I was in the launch going from the uh, airfield to the prison, which is in a, on a peninsula. In, it's, this is a part of Cuba where, where this base is, which we have leased from the Cuban government for 100 years. But anyway, I asked this army three star who was on the on the uh, on the launch with us, uh, why is this prison here? And he said, to be beyond the reach of U.S. law. Now, I you learn a few things in law school. I bet John's a better lawyer. Well, we're both recovering, so I don't know how good either of us is. But I knew enough to think that this isn't going to fly. This is a U.S. facility. Uh, it's going to be covered by U.S. law. What did I do? Nothing. Why? Because this was shortly after 9-11. I was afraid we'd be attacked again, and I thought there must be something about this that I am not hearing correctly or understanding. Uh, guess what? Um, the prison's still there. Our most high-value targets, like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was the mastermind of 9-11, who was subjected to waterboarding by the U.S. government multiple times, and this is equivalent to torture, so he can't be tried because the evidence is tainted. He's still there, and we don't have uh, coherent. And the Supreme Court has declared that you can't, that it can't be. It's within the reach of U.S. law, so all these people are entitled to counsel, which they have. And uh, there they are, and it's 20 years later. And so, if we set this up right in the first place, or and or if we had tried harder to solve the problem, and there are lots of reasons why it was a very hard problem. Obama, by the way, announced on day one or two that he was gonna close it. Well, oops, it's still open. Um, we might be better off because that's, that's uh, B-roll uh, for recruiting bad guys. They show uh, their folks in, in the first versions of this prison, which were you know, behind barbed wire. Uh, it, it, it's really a, a bad story for, for America. Thank you. How can Congress become more bipartisan if the polls show negative results for working on the other side? Well, kudos to California, just saying. Uh, some years ago, uh, we reformed uh, the, the, the drawing of, con of lines for congressional districts uh, by setting up citizen commissions. And that led to a very painful election, uh, which many will remember as Berman versus Sherman, where two Democrats ran against each other and Berman lost. Uh, it was mostly in Sherman's district. So that, uh, you know, and, and Brad is still serving uh, ably in the Congress. Um, but, you know, Howard Berman was also a very uh, important member of Congress. But the point was, this was an objective drawing of lines, not lines drawn by the governor of one party against the, you know, the other party. And the other thing we have is the jungle primary where everybody runs against everybody and you have to win uh, you know, you, you have to beat people in the other party, uh, in your primary, in order to be elected. And what does this do? It forces people to actually listen to some other views and maybe move toward the center. And these two reforms, I think, should be emulated everywhere. There's a, something else that's going on in some states called rank choice voting, which is getting a lot of attention. Maine has it. Uh, I don't know whether California should have it or not. It was apparently on a ballot in Massachusetts and it lost. Go figure. Uh, liberal Massachusetts vote against this. Uh, so, I, and I, I can't say enough, enough about it, but the way you fix this is to elect people from districts where working together, being bipartisan, has a political value rather than uh, working only for the no, you know, very noisy extremes in your party as the political value. And I, again, I don't diminish those people. They have a right to be heard. Uh, and uh, I think their views matter. But what I am sad about is this notion of putting re-election ahead of country. 
And that was never true. Uh, certainly when I was an aide to John Tunney in the 70s, that was just never true. Yeah, let me just add to that. I, I couldn't agree more that the policies that we ad adopted by referendum, and unfortunately not every state has a referendum in California, really helped to, to change this. The, um, uh, you know, the reality is that when you have politicians drawing the districts, and I chaired the first ever uh, City of Los Angeles Citizens Commission on Redistricting, where we redrew the city council districts in 2001. It was the first time they had that program. So I'm very involved in that. When you have politicians drawing the district, whether they're Democrat or Republican, they tend to draw them, because these are mostly done in state legislatures, to make them safe seats. Safe seats meaning if you're a Democrat, you're not going to be challenged by a Republican very effectively and vice versa. The problem is that those aren't safe, because what it does is it opens you up to challenge from the far right or the far left in a primary. And of course, primaries are low turnout elections where the activists tend to have a greater um, percentage participation. And, and the reason that's a problem is, as Jane said, of course, these folks, it, it's important voices. It's great for them to be heard. The problem is when the only voice that it's heard in the electoral process are the far right and the far left, because the moderates, the people in the middle, and by the way, overwhelmingly, the American public, if you take polls, wants to see bipartisanship, uh, but to solve problems. But but it, it it doesn't matter. And what happens is compromise becomes the cudgel to beat candidates with. And that's why we have the phrase the dino and the rhino, a Democrat in name only, Republican in name only. If you your relationship with Susan Collins, as an example, I'm sure people would have used uh, to beat the heck out of you in a primary. And uh, and, and we need to reform this process to the point where, number one, you have districts that really more truly represent uh, communities of interest rather than, you know, these crazy, you know, gerrymander comes from salamander, which is what that one district looked like, uh, you know, when, when they coined the phrase years ago. Uh, but, but also, uh, what I like about the jungle Here. primary, in most primary systems, if you're an independent, you don't get to vote. You only get to vote if you're a registered D or a registered R. And, a, a, you know, a third of the voters in this country are now either declined to state or independence. But in the jungle primary, everybody gets to vote. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, the forces in the middle matter as much as the forces on the far right or the far left. So uh, I think that's a huge reform that's needed uh, really around the country. Thank you. This will be my last question. During the last administration, intelligence agencies underscored the threat of cyber attacks, yet nothing was done to, um, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not quite sure what this word is, U.S. Uh, appeal to cyber, U.S. cyber defense. What immediate steps should be taken by the Biden administration to augment both defensive and offensive capabilities of the U.S.? Okay, well, um, in the last election, uh, a lot of people were afraid of uh, uh, efforts to um, attack our voting machines and our, our actual voting systems on election day or you know, it, it, by absentee ballot. And the focus was there. The focus was not on uh, a broader set of disinformation and misinformation tactics, which has been going on for a while. And uh, you know, we don't have time to go into that. Uh, but uh, in addition to that, the Homeland Security Department, which has primary jurisdiction over cyber um, was just gutted. Um, the, I, I, it was the revolving door of Homeland Secretaries and they kept being fired one after another. And the top levels were gone. And there's an agency set up in the Homeland Department called CISA, which is the cyber agency. And the head of that, a really brave guy, finally got sacked at the end for saying you know, that, that uh, there had been cyber attacks. and uh, Finally, there was a White House function. There was a cyber uh, assistant to the president, a guy named Tom Bossard, and his job was was uh, removed and he was fired. So, I mean, it was just a catastrophe in terms of putting talents against the problem. And so what should be done? We've just been talking about this. Uh, the law requires that a cyber, I just can't remember the name of it, a cyber person uh, be set up in the White House. There's some resistance to that. And there's also this issue about civil liberties. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, the Biden administration now 
is, is putting a lot of talent against this. Uh, the Homeland uh, Department will have a, a, a very highly functioning uh, cyber function. Uh, there are people in the White House now, uh, folks, there's an assistant to the president for cyber. There's a Homeland Security advisor, somebody a lot of us know, Elizabeth Sherwood Randall, who is from Stanford, California, yay, uh, who's you know hugely uh, brilliant. And uh, we'll see what, what the rest of it is, but it's a hard problem, remember. Uh, you have to prevent, which is really hard. Uh, you have to attribute, which is also hard, because a lot of this is disguised. Uh, and then you have to figure out a series of responses that don't make the problem worse, but make the problem better. And, and we're doing that. And so I have confidence that the Biden administration is uh, uh, gonna get us pretty far with this. And I see John nodded, nodding, so I think he agrees. And, um, uh, that's my book. I mean, my book is, let's get on with it. Let's solve some of these problems. Congress has to get back in the game. <laughs> Executive power has to be, it seems to me, uh, uh, reviewed uh, on a regular basis and should not metastasize into crowding out the functions of Congress. And, and the federal courts can't fill that role by themselves, although they've done a pretty able job of pushing back where there have been abuses. I mean, not just in the Trump administration, but before and since, and, and they should continue to do that. But if we want to have a, a government with checks and balances, we've got to work harder. Well, it's a great book, and it's, so uh, it's an honest book. Uh, as, as you've heard, uh, Jane talks about, hey, you know, we made a mistake here, or made a mistake there. It's an honest book, and it really uh, not only is uh, diagnostic in terms of what the problems are, but also pre prescriptive in terms of what some of the solutions will be. And it's only 270 pages, so you can get through it pretty quickly. So any of it, I would encourage everybody to read it and buy it. Thank you. Ms. Harmon, Ambassador Emerson, this was such an informative and timely discussion and so much fun to see the exchange between the two of you. So Ms. Harmon, when we um, resume our in-person events, hopefully later in the year, we'd love to have you come to one of our events and, and connect with our members in person. That would be wonderful. And provided I can bring my, my brother John with. <laughs> A rousing game of tennis on his court. Absolutely. You're a team. You're a team. Thank you both so much.